the movement really operates with two fundamental tactics. It ha- makes us suspicious of each other, um, you know, really divides yes. people. And then we start to, it sort of deflects from the rising the t- uh, tyrannical elements of our, you know, the ruling regime is by making the, the, the people hate each other. But then it also makes us suspicious of our own ability to access the truth. Noel Maring, author of Awake, Not Woke, A Christian Response to the Cult of Progressive Ideology. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thanks for having me. And uh, you're part of the um, the folks who do the uh, theology of home. That's right. And you all talk about how beauty is evangelical. Yes. And that's why I wore a jacket. I never wear a jacket on this <laughs> You wanted to be beautiful. So I wanted to be more beautiful. Yeah. I beautied it up for you. <laughs> you're for... Evangel- evangelizing me right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Um uh, but Awake Not Woke is is uh, that's a kind of a work that you do together, you and Carrie Grass and some other folks. Theology of Home is Theology right. of Home, yeah. yeah. This is your work, yes. Awake Not Woke, and uh, very well received. Uh, and I think a lot of people are like, we needed somebody to say these things. We needed some because it's a very baffling thing to uh, to live in a world where really very positive things. Are, are twisted in a way that's destructive and, and damaging. And the idea that, well, you want to be for justice, you want to be for a just and fair and equitable society. But a, a lot of that is so subtly twisted that you're like, wait, I need some help here. And I think you gave people that help in this book. Yeah, no, I think that that's part of the clarity that people are looking for is that I hear all the time people say, there's something that's off about this. And I'm not sure what, but I certainly want to be on the right side. I want to fight against injustice and certainly racism. And I think one of the things that's happened is that there's no daylight now between that desire to fight for justice and the way the ideology says you demands you to the manner which it has to be implemented. And so they're basically saying, if you don't fight against injustice in the way that we are telling you to do it, then you're not actually having that, that, that right instinct and that right desire to fight against injustice at all. Right. So you're one of the unjust ones, even though what your your desire is for justice, but you didn't do it right. Right. You got to do it the right way. That's right. And that's very, um, it seems almost totalitarian. It's very controlling. It's very controlling. Yeah. And I think that it, it it's a, sort of a bullying coercive tactic, right? Because yeah. I think people really, most normal people, it's a horrifying proposition to, or prospect to be called or told you're a racist or tell, oh, told you're a really? bigot or yeah. told that you're not on the side of, of progress or um, that you're backwards, all these things. Uh, and, and I think that that gets a lot of people who have the right instincts, you know, Christian precepts to be, you know, compassionate, walk with people who are suffering, all these things. And it and it um, it kind of bully or manipulates that, that desire. Right. Um, and so I think the more that we can identify, well, is this actually ha- helping people? You know, does this movement help the people that it claims to? And I think I felt, as I researched it and started looking at it more, that it definitively does not. I think it weakens everyone, particularly right. the people it aims to help. And then once I think people see that, then they can feel more courage and more emboldened to say, no, that's not how, this isn't actually helping people. So I'm not going to support this ideology that I think is actually diminishing. Right. It's very hard in an atmosphere where there's this um, kind of, I don't know if, if censorship is the word, you'll have to tell me, but you you have a kind of stacking up of the mainstream media companies you know with all the new york washington dc the new york times is the washington post and then all the cable news and um you know with an exception here or there and and then you have the social media outfits like twitter who will say you know if you say things like a a a man is not a woman or someone is a biological male when that is an actual fact about a person but uh, it's not one that that person acknowledges, so you're not allowed to say it. There's a kind of s- a sense of um, of being censored, whether or not that is censorship, I don't know. But it, I think a lot of people feel censored. Like I can't stand up to all that. That's right. Yeah. No, I think that the the movement really operates with two fundamental tactics. It ha- makes us suspicious of each other. Um, you know, really divides yes. people. And then we start to, it sort of deflects from the rising the t- uh, tyrannical elements of our, you know, the ruling regime is by making the, the the people hate each other. But then it also makes us suspicious of our own ability to access the truth. Uh, and, you know, I think it's really disorienting in that way. And even the, the example you gave about uh, how, you know, a C- CNN reporter said recently, there's no scientific consensus on whether or not a, a baby is a boy or a girl at birth. 
it just asserted it just really um, like, like duh this is a, just a truism I, I, don't, I don't feel shocked by much that CNN says but the, like you viscerally feel shocked by yeah it. like why do you need a scientific study right everyone this? knows yeah. every child knows it's just obvious but but yeah. I think that's part of it's it's sort of daring you to challenge such an absurd statement it's like right. we can say the most outlandish thing and you can't even question it right because so even that's do, sort of a power play it is yeah. it is right that's a power play so uh the the CNN reporter reports as if this is news or something that, and and this it seems to me that the science is also um, drawn into this into this whole well all the social media media companies are on board and all the the old line media companies are on board the universities and the science departments I don't actually think a lot of scientists necessarily are you know I think most scientists would go yeah there's pretty obvious difference between a boy and a girl at birth but science is somehow uh, co-opted into this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of financial incentives and also reputational, you right. know, career incentives to maintain the party line in ways that are deeply corrupting of the things that should be immune to that type of, you know, politicization. Yeah. Uh, and But it creates this sort of wall of knowledge, you know, this kind of established canon of what is true. Um, just by the sheer right. force and how broadly it is endorsed, you know, across all those platforms you're talking about from, you know, D.C. to New York to media to you know, medical establishment um, to the academy, you know, all these and to our popular culture, certainly. Right. And then the individual ends up feeling powerless and isolated and. And crazy. Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Which is so I, what I wanted to talk to you about this time a bit was in your your book, you break it into various sections and you go through the origins of where the woke, the whole woke ideology uh, started and then the, what are the dogmas of it. But there's a section on indoctrination I, I wanted to ask you about because of what we've seen in the last maybe six months here in the United States. I don't know what's happening around the rest of the world. A sense of parents being shocked at what their children are being taught in the schools um, that the taxes are paying for. Yeah, no, it's been an interesting phenomenon seeing all these school board meetings. It really feels like this right. grassroots movement. Uh, and I wrote an article actually for the American Mind recently about this where, I, you know, I think one of the reasons why so many parents are galvanized in this way, and non-religious parents, by the way, too, and also non-conservative. There's been a real cross-section of parents that have been right. outraged by all of the, you know, the CRT and the gender ideology and all of this being instituted in schools across, you know, public, private, even religious schools. Um, and one of the things I compare it to is that, you know, it's almost like if you've been manipulated or, you, you know, you've been abused or, you know, a certain way, you can maybe put up with something. And then once you see it directed at your child, then that might wow. wake you up. We say, no, right. no, 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 no. You know, I'll, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll, I've been, and it opens your eyes to the manipulation that it's been at play the whole time, I think. But there's something, you know, some mama bear element, papa bear element that really kicks in, I think, when you see this being directed at your your child and you see how manipulate, manipulated, manipulative it is. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's what we're seeing. It's just that sort of outrage. Can I tell you something from my own life? I have two of my children went to public high school. And I regret now that I thought that our family catechesis and our, you know, the Catholic schooling they had gotten and the Catholic family would be powerful enough to sort of be an, an inoculation and i feel now looking back on it was i arrogant and foolish because actually it wasn't powerful enough you know b both of these daughters it, through the experience of california public schools which now i feel almost embarrassed that i didn't think more deeply about this they really got kind of morally harmed by the by what they were taught and uh, and I'm left with regrets about that. I, I, you know, I think that it wasn't foolish so much as it's really hard to wrap our minds around that there would be an actual, you know, a energy and effort trying to indoctrinate children in schools. It right. sounds wild. It sounds like a conspiracy theory. Right. 
Um, but it's right there in the literature if you feel, follow the lineage of, you know, the, the movement when they realized they were not going to have an actual revolution in the streets, decided, well, we'll just move over to the K through 12. Uh, well, to many, multiple institutions, but the, the, the school system was really particularly targeted. And, we've, and I think we've gotten used to that in colleges, but I think it took us a long time to realize that this was actually happening in K through 12 too. Yeah. And aggressively so. And very powerfully so. It's not like- It's effective. You know, you always got that teacher who thinks they're smarter than the parents and they're the friend of the students. And, you know, so they have this kind of influence, but it's not just one teacher. Yeah. It's, this, it's systematic. Yeah. It's training kids to look at the world through a very particular filter that I yeah. think is really compelling. Uh, and I think, you know, you can see the, how children influenced each other, you know, or teenagers influence each other towards this and, and their own social dynamics. So, for example, I don't know if most of us probably have had the experience where someone used some pain or, you know, some trauma in their past or some, you know, sort of victim identification as being a bit of a bludgeon, you know, where they, they'll, they'll, they'll want to silence you and say, you know, you haven't experienced the suffering that I have. You have not walked in my shoes. And, and there's something true there, right? Of course. I, I yeah. haven't experienced that, you know, that, that suffering. Um, everyone has experienced some sort of suffering to varying degrees. And, you know, there's, it, I, there, it seems like a fool's errand to try to, uh, you know, put a metric and a number and a comparison amount to that. But um, but that that is a very compelling experience, I think, when you're silenced. You're told you don't have a place to speak because you haven't experienced that. And I think it gives kids an incentive to sort of look for ways in which they can claim that sort of an identity. You know, uh, so you have all sorts of- So they're seduced of, into it because they see there's a power in victimhood. a power to it, yeah. And so yeah. I think you see, I mean, I think that's a part, piece, you know, not the whole story, but there is a piece of that in the transgender movement and also the LGBTQ movement. Certainly. Where I think a lot of, you know, power kind place. of normal kids are just, are wounded kids are looking for some way to distinguish themselves, you know, and some yeah. way to be- different because there is some sort of power in that identity it feels more exotic but it also feels like you've got a voice now you know yeah. a platform that you didn't have before yeah it's so the the um you you kind of walk through in in that section of the book in the indoctrination section uh some of the ways that uh that developed but it's not what's striking when you talk about uh particularly uh john dewey mm -hmm. is that it's not as if um this is just you know, there's a kind of a, a decline and, and, you know, a cyclical thing or something. This is quite planned. This mm -hmm. is quite intentional um, by people who were, and, and I've, this is the minute I say it, uh, people will say that's a conspiratorial mm -hmm. way to talk, but people who were quite anti-Christian mm -hmm. and, and, and irreligious people themselves who wanted and saw progress as a matter of overcoming the religious kind of, uh, groundings of this society and replacing them with something else. It was quite planned. It was quite planned. So John Dewey had gone and did a bit of like Soviet tourism and he was right. really taken by the school system in particular and realized that there was a real power in, you know, you can churn out sort of a conveyor belt of activists if you can get to them and form them in the education system. And there's one I won't remember the name, um, but he was a, a education, you know, activist and scholar. And he says, to your point earlier about your own experience, that you know, an hour in Sunday school—not that you were limiting your formation to that—but he was basically using that as yeah. an example. Has nothing to can never compete with a five days a week, six hours a day. Right. There's no way that parents can compete to it, and no. we'll, we'll have them then. Right, and that, but and then that all that's happening now in the, whatever is happening in those six hours is then reinforced when the child is exposed to social media at right. home, and a, so it, it's a, it's really a, a twenty four hour full court press now against the child, and yeah. and and a kind of, uh, I think it was it was very impressive to see how people reacted when the the gentleman running for governor of of um, Virginia. Glenn Youngkin, yeah. It, no, the, the other guy oh. said, said um, essentially, why are parents thinking that they should tell schools what to teach? That's right. I think parents were, and I know the, the, the accusation is, well, it's all manufactured, and it didn't feel manufactured at all. It you do like was, not want yeah. your governor saying that right. to you. It seemed like it was lifting the veil, right? You know, it the really did. The, it's like, whoa, you just loud. said what you really think. Right, right. 
And, yeah. I, and, and I think that that's, you know, it's sort of symptomatic of this whole kind of rise of technocracy, you know, where we are deferring everything to the experts and feeling that we have no ability to, you know, form and shape our own world and our own microcultures and our families and our communities, that we really everything relies on sort of this expert class that really has a, adopted a revolutionary mindset and is trying yeah, to instill that throughout all the, through all the, all the institutions. Yeah, so to go back to Dewey then, because mm -hmm. I was very impressed reading this in, in, in Awake Not Woke, a Christian response to the cult of progressive ideology. Uh, Dewey um, doesn't believe in God and, and has a certain view of, of, a, of a godless prog progress in society. Uh, but it becomes so influential because he trains the people who go back to be the superintendents of by i think you said by 1950 he had personally trained a third of the superintendents in the u.s they had come to columbia yeah it, through that system and also herbert marcusa who was kind of the celebrity intellectual of frankfurt school he was he was enormously influential he, he mentored angela davis and the, several members of the weather underground bill you know bill yeah. ayers bernadine dorn and then all those people went on to become, you know, cushy, have cushy chairs at various teaching universities right. or universities across America. Um, and Bill Ayers in particular, I think, has had an enormous influence at uh, outside of Chicago uh, at a teacher's college. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. They will bring, you know, superintendents and principals and then they go back to their, you know, where they're from and then they disseminate kind of the ideology throughout the school district. And I, I want, like, how would you get you know, the young person who wants to be a teacher to participate in this really revolutionary uh, kind of ideology in the classroom, well, you would, what you would do is you would develop a set of kind of government credentialing standards and send everyone to the same schools to get those standards. Yeah, where it becomes the standard. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's incredibly difficult to, for teachers to not start adopting it. Right, because because you, you got to go to these four year schools that have the right to credential you, and that's what they're teaching. They're teaching the John Dewey stuff, and and much more radical than that now. Mm -hmm. And so you get by the time you have your credential, you've you've been fully formed by this. Yeah, and even if you're sort of a silent, got want to slip under the radar, and you don't really buy into it. I mean, at some point you're being silent for so long that you know it's sort of soul sucking in a way. Yeah. You know, you have to keep concealing what you really think and kind of nod along, and um, eventually that stuff's going to break through, or it's just going to. There's the joy is sucked out of your vocation at that point. I would think. Right, right. Um, the homeschooling movement is one solution that people have. Um, I I think that Catholic schools were one. You know that. Um, Many parents have sent their kids to Catholic schools with the sense that they will be protected from the excesses of pu the public schools and be given some, I mean, connection to God and the gospel and Jesus. And uh, it's what's frightening is how many of the Catholic schools have adopted the exact same standards as the public schools. And the many a parent, I've spoken to many parents who say, we worked hard to send our kids to Catholic schools. This is what we thought we, they were getting. This is what they got. Yeah, I think that there's a trust broken. And I've been hearing from, I wrote an article uh, about this happening in the Catholic school uh, almost a year ago. And ever since then, I just hear from parents all over the country just saying, this is happening at my school. This is what's on the website. You know, they bring in diversity, DEI experts, diversity, equity, inclusion. <clears throat> and uh, what's al almost always accompanies that is radical gender ideology. You know, it's, it's never just usually the race thing. It's also, you know, in the Zooms, the teachers are putting their pronouns in. These are Catholic schools. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and they're not teaching the gospel of love. They're not teaching a gospel of mercy and forgiveness. Uh, they're not teaching a gospel in which all of us are sinners before the Lord. They're teaching a gospel of a kind of merciless judgmentalism that's that goes by the name of tolerance that's right yeah i mean i think that one of the things i talk about in the book is that it's a fundamental shift between how we define a person versus uh, you know the, as a christians and catholics we define the human person based on the love of god and for the woke they're defined a person is defined not by the love of god but by the hatred of mankind 
And that gives you two very different missions, right? So the mission in critical theory is to, you need to not spread the gospel of love, but rather spread a gospel of hate, which is you need to give people not the good news, but the bad news that raise their consciousness would be the lingo of the movement. Raise their consciousness to the hatred that's in society, to the misery of their lives until you become hopeless enough that all you can do, your only option left is to revolt, tear it down, you know, build something anew, um, some new future utopia that never seems to work out that way. Right, because he can't. Yeah, <laughs> so we're, we're not capable. You, I mean, I, I, it, it always strikes me that I mean, this the shortest story in the Bible, uh, you know, standalone story is the Tower of Babel, mm-hmm. and it's the story that we get repeat over and over and over and over again. We, we got this. We'll we'll do this without God. We'll do this without the gospel. And but you you don't have the capacity to do it. Right. And it's a, it's and it always involves re-engineering all of reality, right? You know, we yeah. don't respect or receive the givenness of reality. Rather, you no. or your whole goal is to change reality. Um, there's a violence in there, right? Yeah, and I feel like with with my girls who the the two that I was describing earlier, I feel like the best parts of them were exploited in a way that mm-hmm. their youthful desire to be just mm-hmm. and kind and to treat everyone with a, a great dignity was exploited to a new kind of meaning, to have a different kind of meaning, which I think is a distortion of reality. Absolutely. That to me is the most manipulative part, is that it really does take those good hearted instincts and desires and manipulates them. Um, and, you know, I, Part of the horror, I think, of what I've been hearing, too, is so many parents who, particularly with college, they'll send their kids to college and trust that these are, it's a revered institution, and they'll say, my kids came back and they hate me now. Yeah. They just hate everything I stand for. They hate, right. they think I'm regressive. They, you know, they, we just, it's utterly severed our relationship. Right. And that's really heartbreaking. But there is something in the movement that really wants, it's a rejection of history in some ways. You know, it wants to rupture us from our our history, the rest of us from our lineage. I think that's one of the things we see with the tearing down the statues, why that kind of iconoclasm becomes so important. Right. But there's also rejection of our parents, right? There's, if his, if we want to be on the right side of history, it's because we actually disdain history. We want to get be on the right side of progress. We want the future to the most progressive person to yeah. judge us. That it's going to be the, our our measure. Right. And so that that reflects a real disdain for what's come before, and I think that includes our parents. Wow, Noel, that's very, uh, very insightful. I think that you cut the child off from the parent. The parent really is the connection to the rest of human history. It's our, our connection it, it, materially to to all of human history is the parent. You cut off that, and and you say, well, um, they're toxic or something like that. You have one of the other modern labels, and you move on uh, into this world, which is really a world of heartbreak. I mean, I don't the the world of of people trying to change from boys to girls and girls to boys surgically and all that is ultimately just a world of, of heartbreak. There's nothing is going to come from that except people with profound, and we're seeing it. We are seeing more and more people saying how much they regret that, that, you know, when they were depressed, some, they were maybe even manipulated themselves by mental health professionals and, and, and other health professionals into, well, here's what your real problem is. And, you know, changing the, these structures of your physique is, is what's going to cure it. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that cutting off from the family, the lineage that you, you're referencing really leaves us so rootless and in search of an identity because, you know, it used to be, or it ought to be that we are given an identity in our family. You know, you're named, you're known, you're particular, you're irreplaceable. And if you don't have that sort of belonging, significance, um, identity, you're going to open yourself up to any identity on offer. But they're, you know, they want to feel significant. They want to feel, you know, that sort of um, particularity that comes with being named and known that we receive from our family and from our Lord. Um, And I think that this is sort of in a perverse way, kind of manufacturing that sort of unique identity where you can kind of invent yourself in this particular way, even at the cost of, you know, mutilating your very own body. And then somehow that's going to be the solution to your misery. And I think that's what the woke movement is training us to, to, to do is to take our unhappiness, our woundedness that's come from, you know, dissolution of family life, the dissolution of these common bonds and these roots. And it's saying, well, the cause of your misery is some group outside of yourself, you know, the patriarchy or whiteness right. or something, or the cause is that the, it's the moral law, you know, moral law is oppressing you. And so if you can tra- transgress the moral law, you You're know, by becoming a, a different better. gender, by becoming, yeah. you know, by becoming um, sexually promiscuous or whatever, what have you, 
um, then that in some ways you'll be able to liberate yourself from that misery and from that oppression. That's right. sort of the promise. But of course, it just leads to more and more misery. And I yeah. think people are, are, are waking up to it and w wanting a different road. It does feel uh, that we're at a kind of some kind of tipping point one way or the other, either into an irreconcilable conflict where there will be some people who will maintain a connection to history, reality, God, one another, and then there will be others who will uh, utterly reject that and 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 uh, be incapable of anything but conflict with with that. Or maybe it's going to be decided one way or the other. And I think a lot of like a lot of Catholics that I hear from, they pretty they're pretty convinced it's going to be decided against them. Like you just wait, they're going to outlaw the Catholic faith. We're not going to be allowed to go to church. And it doesn't seem all that unrealistic anymore that that could happen. But I, I wonder if those people entertain the possibility that the other could happen too, that we could throw off the nightmare of unreality that we're living in. Yeah. I'm a terrible prognosticator, but an optimist at heart. So I tend yeah. to be on the more hopeful side, but then also just seeing how deliberate and how effective the revolution, this revolutionary ideology has been, I can certainly understand where the doomsdayers are coming yeah, from right, as right. well. Uh, so let me just ask you this then uh, be before we close. And thank you very much for taking the time with right, us. Yes. No, it's been fun. Um, say I was starting out with my kids right now uh, and I'm just starting to raise them. And I haven't thought deeply about these things. I know that I have a discomfort with the division in society and all that. What would you say to the parent about their role in protecting the child from ideologies in education uh, and getting the child a genuine education, which forms them as a, a human being? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's become clear and just even just as recently as the last couple of years that we can no longer sort of assume goodwill on the part of whatever educational institution we're sending our kids to. So I would say you've got to do a lot of research and mm. um, due diligence about the school and also the school culture. Uh, and it's worthwhile, I think, moving someplace where you're going to have like-minded families oh. and shared values and all of these things, because especially with you know technology, I think just even just a, a school culture where phone, iPhones are not ubiquitous, it's really hard to find that. But I think it makes a huge difference, you well, know. And yeah. your kids, then your kids aren't feeling like they're the odd ducks because they don't have a smartphone in their pocket, right. you know. Right, where other families are supporting that. Yeah, yeah, and not everybody, not every family is a homeschooling family, so it feels like yeah. there's got to be something for those families too. And I, I it just feels like there are fewer and fewer of those options. Yeah, we're very fortunate to have one in our town, but there there are very good kind of, you know, classical education tends to be yeah. a shorthand for this going right. to be a like-minded community. Right. Uh, and they do they are they are around, uh, but you have to seek them out. Yep. Uh Noel Maring, the author of Awake Not Woke: A Christian Response to the Cult of Progressive Ideology. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Many people have a feeling of unease that these new movements, especially as they're being taught to our children, are not quite right. Something is off with these things. But we have all these very good things being taught, justice and equality and care for victims. So how could that be off? Well, maybe they're being twisted just enough, perverted just enough so that when we talk about justice, it's not justice that we're getting, but injustice. When we talk about equality, it's not equality that's following upon that. It's inequality and care for victims is not really care for victims. It's more of creating a victim mentality. The consequence of which is separating children from their parents, children from their history, and in the worst case, separating children from the God who became man and walked among us, Jesus Christ, our savior. That's a really awful outcome when we want to avoid as much as we possibly can. And that means standing up to these ideologies which use very good words, very good concepts to actually undermine what's good and in some cases do what's evil. Uh, thanks very much for being with us. I know that this will be uh, one that will maybe lots of folks will want to comment on. If you'd like to send us a comment, if you'd like to send us a suggestion or a correction or whatever, you can always email us. Focus at Catholic.com is our email address. Focus at Catholic.com. Please support us financially. We need your help to keep doing what we're doing. You can do that by going to give catholic.com if you're watching on youtube 
Don't forget to subscribe and hit that little uh, bell there so you'll be notified when new episodes are available. If you're listening on one of the podcast services, if you would like and subscribe, uh, you'll also be notified when new episodes are out there. And if you would, give us that five-star review, maybe a few nice words that helps to grow the podcast. I'm Cy Kellett, your host. Thanks very much to Noelle Maring for her uh, very fine work and for her spending time with us. We'll see you next time, God willing, right here, Catholic Answers Focus. Mm-hmm.